Uh, leg dogs versus arm dogs. Hey, I'm Pat Stewart. I'm a dog trainer and coach, and every month I go live for hours answering questions about dog training, life, the universe, and anything else people want to ask. Here's a clip from one of those sessions. Ben Perkins, after watching a lot of dogs at PSA Nats, what's your input on leg dogs versus arm dogs in general? That's a great question. In particular, smaller dogs like mine, I've heard from both sides that being up in the air on drives isn't ideal, so I should make her a leg dog, but fast leg dogs are going to get jammed, so make her an arm dog. I'm assuming there's also a dog's preference to consider also. Yeah, so... Uh, leg dogs versus arm dogs. I think that uh, it's fair as a handler to have a preference on which one you like your dog to do. And I think that also you'll find that mother nature tells the dog which one it will like to do better as well. So there is for sure a genetic predisposition to biting in a particular way and targeting a particular place. That usually always exists in dogs that are bred for the purpose, okay? So um, upper body versus lower body. In the sports, you got to remember sports are just that, right? There's rules by which it all goes down. And what we see is that uh, there's points in PSA, especially in strike, right? So a bill, like people want to see the impressive hits. And, you know, big part of the – the game is impressing the judge and impressing the crowd who therefore impress the judge, right? So uh, upper body hits are more impressive typically in PSA. What we see though in sports where you can eschieve the dog is that they're all leg dogs, high inside leg dogs usually, and they're taught how to, um, you know, target a pivot leg. So when you look at ring and sort of upper level Mondio dogs that, you know, know more ring type techniques, you're going to see uh, dogs that usually will hit the the part of the body that is less likely to be able to move out of the way of them, right? And, and therefore that's going to grow, you know, like, hugely affect the dog's entry and the dog's send in speed and the way that the dog interacts with the decoy in general. Right? Now, it's not to say that a leg dog or a ring type dog will be slower, in fact, the opposite, but it's going to enter very differently and its choices that it's making, its thought processes along the way to the bite are going to be different rather than a dog that just has like a primary targeting area, be it the arm or the leg, whatever. So the preference really is to the handler to choose which one do you, like where do you want to allocate the points because the dog if the dog is really capable take my own dog for example he is genetically he has a strong preference for the legs right and i that's very very observable in that he um he'll take a bicep on the um entry right like on a frontal bite but i trained him kind of kmpv style right so it's a bicep on the on the on the frontal but a leg on an escape right so as you're running away he'll hit your leg now uh i train that that way just because i like that picture i think that it results in the safest thing for my dog given the access to the decoys that i have now going forward that might change right um but uh you're right that leg catches, especially in PSA, are tricky. Um, now, if a dog hits the leg clean, it's fine. But a lot of the a lot of the reasons why dogs are leg dogs in PSA is their crossovers from other sports. And when you get a dog from a Mondio crossover or from a French ring crossover, they're not going to target, especially. Um, accurately or they're not going to consistently hit the same leg in fact they've been trained and imprinted not to do that in their development so that's what makes it tricky for a psa dog that's a crossover is a leg dog i usually get a bit like uh when someone says i got a leg dog because i'm like uh, like is it going to be the leg that you tell me? Because it's it's difficult. Like, you know, I've been at trials where the dogs are changing their minds all the way down the field or even at the last moment change their mind about what leg they're going to hit, which makes it very difficult as a decoy, first of all, to present the, com the correct amount of pressure required for PSA and also to catch the dog safely. Um, in a way that, you know, keeps everybody safe and then the drive can happen appropriately after that, right? So that's tricky in and of itself. Um, now, that's sport. So in sports, you, you do whatever. You, you make the choice. You, you, with a strong dog, it can be either one, whatever you prefer. 
Now we can go into this idea of preferences and the least, the less strong the dog is, the more careful you have to be, right? You have to like take, you know, make choices that are going to set the dog up for success. But here's one of the really weird things about uh, upper body versus lower body dogs is that a dog that bites in the legs, like an old Belgian sort of idea, there's a saying, but I, I'm not going to try and, I'm not going to try and speak Flemish. I, I, Bart taught it to me one time, the exact words, but I'm not going to try and butcher it. But there's a saying that a, a dog that will choose the legs is a stronger dog, right? That a dog that chooses to bite in the legs accepts that pressure will come from higher, um, accepts that he puts himself in a position of, like a less dominant position in the fight and is therefore willing to accept that because he doesn't perceive the thing that or the person he's fighting as being really able to um, influence him. So he takes risks that he doesn't, doesn't perceive them as risks. What's also true is that some really weak dogs go well in the legs. So it seems like from my observation, and certainly, you know, I've had this conversation with many people who are at the, the really high levels of understanding this stuff, is that you typically get the very strong dogs that do well in the legs and the weaker dogs that do well in the legs. And the stronger dogs do well in the legs because they accept the pressure from higher and they accept more of it. And the weaker dogs because they can keep all four feet on the floor. And they probably feel a lot more in control of themselves, a bit more powerful, as well as, you know, like their mechanics of their body can be uh, in a way that, um, you know, suits them better. In that what we, you know, it seems to be the hill I'm going to end up dying on. I keep teaching it to so many people, uh, is the the biomechanics of a dog's spine, right? So like a dog wants its spine flat. And when you start bending their head up like this in order to bite, it's a very uncomfortable position. And so the dog needs to straighten its spine. And what we see from people who have the dog biting and the dog's like neck twisted up, especially if it's in an upper's bite, is that the dog then wants to pull its body underneath in order to straighten its spine. And that sort of results in a lot of that pulling. Whereas if you get a like a, a weaker dog that's less engaged in the fight and you put it in the, on the legs and teach it to come over the top, so now from the uh, line of its spine, if it bites like this, it comes up and it feels and goes into a more dominant position by trying to straighten its spine. So that's a consideration as well. Then we can talk you know, real-world biting. And what we see in the sports where you're allowed to try and escape the dog, which is what's going to happen in the real world, they're all leg biters because, you know, I certainly, I've escaped plenty of police dogs really easily that are real biting dogs who have had multiple live bites. In fact, I had a guy many, many years ago, we had um, sort of a, a interesting conversation with where uh, he was a policeman, uh, he had a police dog, was in the U.S., um, and the dog was a huge flyer. It was from a sport program and it was a really good dog, very powerful dog. And it had bites, but it was a big flying dog. Like it would launch. Now in the sports, we love that shit. That's awesome points, right? But in the real world, dogs don't have wings. And as I pointed out to this guy, the moment she, it was a female dog, the moment her feet leave the ground, she's stuck on the trajectory that she's taken because she can't move when she's flying. She can't manipulate herself in the air. And so we were at a, a football field. He pulled up in his cruiser, pop, hit the popper and sent the dog to bite me. And I was all the way down the field. And the bet was that I could touch him before the dog bit me. And I did, right? I just escaped the dog multiple times, forward and backward. It took me quite a while of running around. I was pretty exhausted on the field. But I managed to touch the handler before the dog um, actually managed to bite me. Now, his argument was that he would have shot me. And I was like, fair enough, right? Like, I get it. But that's the reality of real world bites, I think, should happen in the legs. But add to that, there's this thing that like seems to be pretty common in the biting world, like the real world biting world, is that a dog like shouldn't bite in the legs. This is really common in a lot of military units for some stupid reason. They don't like dogs biting in the legs because they think that because the pressure can come down, right? But the moment someone says that shit to me, it's like exposing that they haven't got a fucking clue. Like it, it basically is like it, it, it's like they may as well just go, oh, I've got big feelings but no experience because um, like bites don't happen. A real bite doesn't happen anything like what happens to a bite in the suit, right? People start fighting immediately and like have a look at all the footage of every police dog type bite. It goes to ground almost immediately, right? doesn't matter where the dog bites the person 
almost immediately and with the overwhelming majority of cases, that fight goes to ground almost immediately. Just like fighting real people, right? This is why jujitsu is considered so effective and it's why they go to ground so often is because that's what happens in fights, right? Like most fights end up as a grapple on the floor. It's very rare that we'd like just go fist to cuffs and duke it out standing. Someone tackles someone, someone falls over, whatever, however it goes down. And that's what happens with dog bites as well, right? So the... The other thing to consider when we're talking bites as well is that your arms, right, like as a person, your hands are your weapons, right? These are designed to take damage. And within your like, you know, not to be overly morbid, but if you've ever seen anyone like cut their wrists, it is not an easy thing to do to cut your wrists in a way that you will bleed out because you are designed that your the veins and everything is designed you're like it's all quite deep everything that will be damaged and result in you not being able to fight in that moment is quite deep and difficult to damage on your forearms on your biceps on your hands because you're designed to be doing this shit with them right whereas on your legs like the, the big difference the, the, the best way this was ever explained to me was you know when you get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and you're half asleep and you're walking through the house especially say you're in a hotel room where you don't know the layout right so you're half asleep walking through there if you bump your arm you bump into a shot into the wall you bump your whole like bicep your forearm you could hit your you could hit your forearm on the edge of it like that all of those things is going to be like oh that's annoying you smash your shin into a coffee table. That's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. And that's the reality of dog bites is that when you're teaching dogs to bite people, their arms are what is designed to take damage and continue to be able to fight. Your legs are not, right? So all of that feeds into the picture of like what's appropriate, what's not. Now for me in the sports, I, I have an upper body dog because I like the, the entry. I like the way it goes in. And with the, the decoys that I have access to and the type of decoys that I train, it's safer for the dog and it's safer for them, right? Uh, when a leg dog gets jammed, it really gets jammed, right? Like it is a straight stop. Whereas an upper body dog, at least the person tends to sort of at least sort of um, jar themselves back a little bit. So all of that, all that consideration, I think that, um, for your dog though, I would definitely consider trying her out in the legs, see how she goes in the legs. Um, all right. I think that's, uh, let's, let me see if I just answered everything, Ben. I'm assuming there's all, yeah, I think I got it all. All right. Um, one thing, uh, you like, I've seen a lot of, um, people try and convince a dog out of, doing what mother nature tells it to do. And the, the truth is uh, when the stress gets real and the dog is really fighting, it's going to revert back to what genetics tells it to do. That's going to happen. And so I tend not to try and influence that too much. Like if the dog shows a really, really strong preference for being a leg dog, like a really strong preference and it's you're struggling to bring it to the upper body, then I think regardless of your circumstances and all the other things that we just discussed, it's probably better to put it in the legs and let it get good at that and practice it and do all that kind of thing because chances are when the pressure gets high enough, it's going to do that anyway. And that's the reality of like all the grip work, all the targeting, everything that we do with dogs is that at the end of the day, when the stress gets high enough, it's going to revert back to what mother nature tells it to do. And the whole point of training is to train through to the point where the stress doesn't get high enough that uh, like the same situation doesn't create enough stress for it to like do a re resort back to, you know, to genetics, it still continues to do what it's been trained to do. But um, it, when it's appropriate, tr don't fight genetics, just let, let genetics do its work. If you like that video, consider subscribing to the channel. There's new stuff coming out all the time. And if you wanna ask a question on one of those live streams, you can do that by joining the Patreon of my podcast, which is called The Canine Paradigm. The link's in the description. Here's the playlist of a bunch of other questions being answered.